C Sharp and Microsoft SQL were made for each other. Where you find one, you often find the other. However, as a developer, getting a full copy of SQL Server onto your development machine can be tricky. Or at least, that used to be the case. In this video, I'm going to show you how to get SQL up and running on your development machine in about five minutes using Docker. But we aren't going to stop there. Maybe you have SQL backups running either personally or at your company. How do you know those backups are actually valid? The only way you can be sure is to test them. We'll create an automated script to install SQL, restore the backup, and even sanitize the data if desired. With these tools, you can make working with SQL Server quick, simple, and automated. I bet those aren't words you normally associate with SQL Server. Now, today's topic is going to cover using Docker. Docker is a really powerful tool that is taking over the software development industry, and it can do a lot more than what I'll show you today. I'll explain everything as I, as I go, but if you get stuck, or if you decide that now is the right time for you to learn more about how Docker works, I put a link in the description to my Getting Started with Docker course. Check it out. The introduction, where I introduce Docker, what it is, who it's for, and what the benefits are, that whole introduction is free to watch. Also, in the description is a link to a, the code pieces that I'll be using today. That link will let you download a PDF where I have put together all the steps for each type of database project we do. I also have the Docker files that we use and the scripts that we run. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and get started. Now, if you don't have Docker, you can go to hub.docker.com, which is what I have here. And I am logged in right now. And once you're logged in, you can see this, this blue button right here. It says download Docker desktop. Do so and install it. And once you do, we're going to use the Linux version of Docker. Now, don't get confused. I'm on Windows. But Docker can allow me to run Linux containers on my Windows machine. And that's what I'll be doing. So we're using... SQL Server on Linux. Okay, so if you want to follow along, that's how I've configured my system. Now, for this, we'll also be using the Microsoft SQL Server images. And if you go to hub.docker.com and search for Microsoft SQL Server, this is what you get. And in here, it tells you exactly how to use their various images. So latest update to SQL Server 2017. Here is the command you would run to get that. Now we won't use it yet, but I also pulled down a version of the AdventureWorks sample database. This is from Microsoft and it's their way of showing off the different things they can do inside SQL Server. And so I downloaded the AdventureWorks LT or lightweight full database backup for 2017. It really hasn't changed a whole lot since I believe 2012 or so. And this download is only a few megabytes. It's not very big. Okay, so those are the three things that I have done to set things up. I've installed Docker. I know which image I want to use from the hub.docker.com. Hub.docker.com, by the way, is a way to find images from different companies and we use these as base images to then put our own stuff on top of. So in this case, I'm going to use a base image that has SQL Server already installed in it. And then finally, we have that backup file for use later. Okay, so let's pull up PowerShell here. Now, if you don't know where to get PowerShell, you can just hit the, um, the Windows key and hold it down, hit X. That'll pop up a little menu. And one of the options should be PowerShell. It may be Command Prompt. But if it is, then just hit the Windows key and then start typing PowerShell and it should come up. So PowerShell is, it brings a little bit extra to the table when it comes to Docker because we can do um, some of the PowerShell command line stuff that makes it a little simpler. I also just made that, that font a little bigger so you can see it a little easier since especially at the top of the screen. So right now I am at C temp Docker. And if I pull that up, You'll notice that at ctemp docker, I have three things. I have that backup file, that SQL backup file, and I have two SQL scripts, which I've written. Now we'll get to those in a minute, 
But for now, that's all I have. But before we get to actually creating Docker files or working with Docker files, we're just going to do a very simple command line. Because the first command is actually going to be to just, just give me a SQL Server. That's all I want. Okay? So Docker run dash E, this is an environmental variable. So we're going to do is we're going to run an image. Now, the first thing is the environmental variable is in quote, double quotes, except underscore EULA equals Y. And this is a, a SQL Server command. When you install SQL Server, one of the things you have to do is accept the end user license agreement. Now, it's kind of frustrating that you have to do this when you're installing it in Docker, but it really does force you to say, yes, I accept the end user license agreement, even though obviously we haven't, we're not reading it when we're doing it because no one really reads those, do they? Okay. Next environmental variable is the SA underscore password. Now, SA is a system administrator. So I'm going to give it a system administrator password. Now, this is a development machine and it's going to be just for me to use. So I'm going to show you my password because it's really not super secret. PWD one, two, three, four, five exclamation point. That's my pretty standard, um, unsafe password. So what this will do is it will set up when, when SQL installs, it's going to say, what is the system administrator password? It's going to set it to this value, the PWD one, two, three, four, five exclamation point. And then when I go to log in a SQL, I can use these credentials. SA is username and the password is what I just typed there. Now I also need to map a port. See by default, SQL talks to, or you can talk to SQL on port 1433. However, if I already have SQL installed on my machine, which I actually don't anymore, but if I did, that would conflict with the SQL on my local machine because this port is for SQL on the container. So I'm going to say, give me port, uh, one, 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 four, three, three. And that's going to be colon. That's going to be 1433 internally. So it's saying the port on my host machine is going to be one, one, four, three, three. That's what it's going to listen for. And that's going to forward it on the container on port 1433. I'm also going to run this in disconnected mode, which disconnected mode mode means that it's not going to um, listen on this command terminal for any commands or anything that goes across the wire to our SQL server. It's just going to start it and let, let it go. All right. And finally, the last thing here is going to be, I'm going to shrink this window down so we can do this. I'm going to shrink this down so that we can see the, this command written on the second line. This is going to be the, the image to use. So after the dash D, I'm going to put a space and then an MCR. Whoops. Let's shrink it down a little bit more. There we go. MCR dot Microsoft dot com slash MSSQL slash server colon 2017 dash latest. Now, how did I know that? Well, that came from right here. We have, if you want, there's a whole list of different images that are in here. Notice the, the tags and then the actual image name is listed up here. So you can see, um, like their examples, actually this one right here, I believe mcr.microsoft.com slash MSSQL server colon 2017 dash latest. Okay. So I could just copy that right there, or I can replace this after the colon, the 27 dash latest with one of these versions down here. So if I wanted the 2017 dash cumulative update nine for Ubuntu, I could grab that one instead. So you can test different versions of SQL Server if you want. But in our case, I'm just going to grab the latest version of 2017. Notice also it specifies the environmental flags. That was the, that dash E. 
So accept EULA equals Y, SA password. And then this last one, the MSSQL PID, which is a product ID, it specifies which SQL Server product you want. And by default, it's developer. Developer is free to use. So we're definitely going to be using developer. You can't use that in production because it's not for production, it's for development. But um, in our case, that's fine because we're in development mode. Okay, so we've got the name of the image. That's this right here. Then we have a colon. And then we have the, the tag it's called. And the tag you want is 2017 latest. So a latest version of 2017 SQL Server. And since we did not specify a dash E for the product ID, it's going to be the developer edition. Okay, so I've talked a lot, but really this command is all you have to run and you hit enter. When you do so, it says, hey, I can't find that image locally. So what it's doing is it's downloading the image from the hub. Now this image is, I believe, one point three maybe gigabytes or so of space. So this will take you a little bit of time. And that's what we're waiting for right here. It's um, downloading. There we go. So it's, it's completed all of these. I have not paused this video. Um, my internet's pretty good. So it, it's downloading pretty rapidly. But once this is done and it's done, we've now downloaded SQL Server. And now this right here, this is the ID of the running container. What does that mean? It means SQL Server is already downloaded, it's already installed, it's already configured, and it's already running. Just to prove that, let's open up this right here. Now the port number I chose was 11433. So if I say connect, and I say localhost, comma, You'd think colon, because that's typically what we use is colon for the port number. It's actually comma. So 11433. So localhost, comma, 11433. You have to use SQL Server authentication, so SA. And the password is capital P, lowercase wd, one, two, three, four, five, exclamation point. Let's go ahead and remember that and hit connect. And there we go. I have a working SQL Server on my machine running in Docker. Now we're about 12 minutes into the video, but in terms of actually typing that command out and then hitting enter, it took less than two, including the download. So in two minutes, you can have SQL Server on your machine. The really cool thing is if I were to, and let's just look at this. We're gonna clear the screen, say uh, Docker PS-A. They show you all the images on the machine. In this case, we've got a, um, here is our, sorry, it's kind of crunched because it's so long. This is the image. Then we have the command that we ran, that's right there. It was created about a minute ago and it is currently up for about a minute. So it's been running and then here's the port that it mapped across. And it's called uh, Romantic Thompson. That name is generated automatically for us. So that's currently running. But if I were to say Docker stop and let's do 710, that's the, the container ID, the start of it. So Docker stop F710. Now that stopped. Now if I were to try and go back to SQL Server, it would time out trying to connect to that. But I, then I can blow it away. Let's just do docker remove 710. And now 710 is gone. If we do clear screen and say docker ps-a, you'll notice there's no containers there at all. Now, if we do docker images, you'll see that we still we do have a downloaded copy of MS SQL server. And it, yes, it's 1.33 gigabytes. So if I were to clear a screen, and I run that same command we ran earlier. This command to actually do a Docker run, and I hit enter. Watch how fast this goes. Done. 
SQL Server has been installed, configured, and is running. And just to prove that, if I were to hit refresh here, it's it's still there. We can add databases, no problem. You know, if I were to put database here and call it test, there we go. I can hit refresh, and there's a test database. So just that little bit of since it's already been downloaded, just a little bit of time, it installs and gets SQL Server running. Think of the implications of this. If you need to test SQL Server for some reason, if you want to demo the idea of having a, a SQL Server somewhere besides your web server, you can actually point to this IP address and the, um, the port number, and it will act like it's on a different machine. You can run your C Sharp applications against a SQL Server in Docker. Okay. And then when you don't want to use SQL or you're not using SQL, you can turn off the container. What that means is SQL Server is pretty memory intensive. It takes up a lot of memory as it's running. Well, if you do Docker stop, it stops the, the container. It turns everything off. And now SQL Server is not using any resources except for file storage space on your computer. And even that is not a ton. It's only at 1.3 gigabytes. So you can have SQL Server just when you need it. You can turn it off. If you ever have a problem with configuration where you need to, you, know, you broke something, no problem. You just come back over here. You say Docker stop AE3, I'm sorry, AE0. Notice that's the ID, so therefore I grab the first three letters. AE0, I stopped it. Docker remove AE0. And we do Docker PS, it's no longer there. If I come back over to my SQL Server over here, if I were to hit refresh, I'm not gonna do it because it takes a while, but that's gonna be gone. Now just to prove that though, if I were to run that command again to create a new container, Remember, I deleted the old container. New container, I hit refresh, it's back. Notice no database. I had a database there, but that was in the old container and I deleted it and it's gone. So that's how fast you can get SQL Server up and running on your machine for testing. But like I said, we're not gonna stop there because while that's really cool and I think that's what the majority of you will probably use this for, is just get SQL Server up and running to test things out. It's a lot more like a real world environment compared to the local DB. You can have more configuration, more, more options there, but we can go farther than this. For example, right now we're starting fresh every time. We're resetting our, our container when we delete it and start over, we're resetting it back to factory default essentially. Well, what if we have data that you want to put back in there, a database? May we have a test database that you want to back up and then restore into a new container? Or maybe you have your production database that you want to restore into a container to test something out um, outside of production. We want to test something out. Well, we can do that with Docker as well. So let's clear a screen here. Let's uh, look at our images. We have just the one and docker ps-a for containers. Let's stop this container. So docker stop 9c0, docker remove 9c0. There are faster ways of doing that, but, but that's what I'll do. I won't do a kill or something like that. Kill is a little more drastic, but since you're removing it, it doesn't matter. All right, so now we have that, we have no images except for the, the SQL Server image that Microsoft gave us. We'll keep that download so we don't have to re-download it. We have no containers at all, not even stopped containers. The dash A allows you to see stopped containers. So Docker PS shows us containers, but only running ones. Dash A includes the stopped ones. So with that, we're reset back to start. Now let's talk through a little bit more of a a complicated process, not, not overly complicated, but complicated enough that uh, we want to map it out into a, a Docker file. 
So let's bring over Notepad and let's create a Docker file. Now, if you're not familiar with Docker file, what a Docker file does is it allows us to specify the steps of building a new image. Just like that, that Microsoft SQL image we had, well, we're gonna build an image on top of that, basically build a layer on top of that. So we're gonna say from, this is where we're gonna start from, mcr.microsoft.com slash mssql slash server colon 2017 dash latest. Look familiar? That's the image we used just recently. Now we're gonna call this as the build image. And we're gonna set up environmental variables to accept EULA equals Y and environmental variable of SA underscore password equals PWD one, two, three, four, five exclamation point. And then we're gonna set up a, a work directory to be slash temp. Now that working directory is on the, on the image. So it's not on our machine, it's on the image, which is why you have the, the Linux style pathing. So we're gonna set up a temp directory. Now that temp directory doesn't exist yet, but since I said set the working directory there, it will create that directory if it doesn't exist. Now, I'm gonna put this Docker file in this C temp Docker location. And I want to copy over the backup because we're gonna restore this backup as part of our process. So I'm gonna say right here, I'm gonna say copy, and I, I'm gonna look at off a screen so you can just see what's on the screen. Um, AdventureWorks works LT 2017.back, okay? So the path is relative to where this Docker file is, and it's in the same folder, therefore, just give it the file name, and I copy over to dot, which means the local path on the image, which is currently set to a working directory of temp. So it's gonna copy it to the TMP folder. I'm also gonna restore over this restore-backup.sql. What is that? Well, let's open it up. So I'm gonna pull up SQL here and I'll drag it on. And this is, let's, let's make this bigger. So let's, there we go. Better, let's do this. Okay, so here's our script. Where we store the database adventure works. From disk and location is slash temp, because this is gonna be local to the image. So slash TMP slash adventureworks LT 2017.back. Okay, so we just copied that file over to the that TMP folder. Now we're gonna run this script. We haven't called it yet, we're just copied over. But when we do, we're gonna run this script and it's going to look for adventureworks in this location. Well, we just copied over, so we're good. And then it says down here, move, and it has two entries the AdventureWorks LT2012 underscore data, and the same as log file. So, and moves it to this location on disk. Now this gets a little SQL technical. Um, so if you're not familiar with this, don't worry. You can pretty much copy and paste these with a couple of tweaks. The one thing you have to do is know what these file names are called. Now there's scripts you can run to bypass that. And I thought about that, but that makes it, uh, a much more complicated script. And while that'd be really cool and it'd work really well, and it could even uh, not have to hard code things like these names, the downside is that you couldn't modify it unless you're a SQL expert. And I would prefer not to go that route. So what you can do to test these things out is you can run a command. So if you had SQL or SSMS running locally, you could run the command to do a restore file list only from disk equals, and then put a path in. So see temp docker 
AdventureWorks LT 2017.back, like so. If you run this, and I believe this should work because I'm not actually connected. Uh, it's not going to want me to do that. Um, let's connect to my local DB. Okay, so there we go. So what gave me, and this is hard to see, so I'll zoom in. What it gave me here is the logical names are these two right here, which if you note is the same as these two names right here. So that's all I did was I, I ran this command, the restore file list only from disk to find out what those names are from this backup file. Once I had those, I can say, okay, here's what I want you to name the MDF file and the LDF file and where to place them. Okay. LDF is for logs. MDF is for data. Okay. Um, if you don't want to worry about that, don't worry about it. Um, you can just use this AdventureWorks database and, and try it on your own and work just fine. Okay. So that's what this script does is it just restores from backup and it places the, the data file and the log file in the right locations for where we want them. Now, I won't say this because it has this extra thing in there. Okay. So we're going to copy that file over as well. So copy restore dash backup dot SQL over a dot same temp directory. So now what we need to do is we need to run a run command run slash OPT slash MS SQL slash bin slash SQL server. No E this is what tripped me up the first time I did it. This, um, it's serve S E R V no E R. Okay. So I had like, like that, that's not correct. It's S E R V. Okay. So just note that's, um, it's a little tricky. Um, oh, I'm sorry. There's an R at the end. So there's no, there's no, there's no E here, but there is an R. And yeah, it's, um, I believe it's because of the eight characters, notice four and then eight characters. That's usually a limitation. And so they had nine characters of SQL server. So they cut out the, the last E. Okay. So then we do a dash dash except dash EULA and sleep. I'm going to do sleep 10. This is up to you. So what, what happens here? is it's going to run the installation. It's going to accept the end user license agreement and it's going to sleep for 10 seconds because of the fact that the installation may take a few seconds. And so instead of um, putting a, a monitor on there and you can do that, you can it has a little more complex code and monitor when the installation is complete. But I have found that 10 seconds seems to be just fine. And the grand scheme of things, waiting 10 seconds for my installation to be done when I only need to wait for five seconds isn't a big deal. Okay. Some people put 20 or even 30 seconds here. I think that's probably too much. But if your machine is slow or you have problems where it, you're seeing these, uh, not seeing uh, success when you do this installation, you may be stepping on your own toes. And you want to expand that from 10 to something more like 15 or 20. Okay. So we're going to run multiple run commands together. So I'm going to put up a, a slash. It's a, um, this direction slash, I believe that's a backslash. Okay. Uh, I'm not good with forward versus back. I have a hard time with spatials, but, um, put that slash, I believe it's a backslash. Okay. So, then the next line say double ampersand. And so now that SQL server is installed, we want to do slash OPT slash MSSQL dash tools slash bin slash SQL command dash capital S localhost. That's the, so we're going to run a SQL command. So it has to connect a SQL server. So you say, okay, what, what SQL server? Well, it's localhost because it's, on the same container, or it's going to be the same container um, as 
where you're at, or same image, actually. So dash capital U, this is our um, login name. So username is SA and dash P, put in double quotes, PWD12345 exclamation point and dash I. And this is going to do a uh, slash TMP slash restore dash backup dot SQL. So that's going to run that script that does the restoration of the backup file. Now at the end of this, we do another backslash and we do double ampersands in the next line and do p kill SQL server, again, no E. So SQL server. And what that'll do is it will stop SQL server because we're just building this image. This is a build image. Now, what we're gonna do next is we're going to create another one of these right here. So from again, same location, but this time we're gonna call it, um, let's call it release. And we're gonna set up the ENV for accept EULA equals Y. If I can get the right key, there we go. And then we're gonna do a copy. I'm gonna explain this in just a minute. So copy from equals build. So we're copying from the build location. We're gonna say slash var slash opt slash mssql slash data. Look familiar? Well, that's the location where we were um, saving our files, our um, MDF and LDF files. And we're gonna copy from the build, this location to the release, same location. Now, why do we do that? Well, we have two images here. We have the build image, which is where we, we copy over the backup file, we do the restore, and then once we're done that, then we shut it down. And the reason we're doing this is because this is our, our build up server. This is where we get everything configured and run, but you wouldn't want to distribute an image that has your backup files on it and maybe even your passwords. So we're going to, once this is done, this build server is done building and installing SQL and it's done restoring the backup. Then we take, we build a new SQL server. And from that, we copy from the build server we copy those, the MDF and LDF file, the restored files. We copy just those files over. And now we'll use this release uh, image as the final image. We can also call it final. My, I think Microsoft calls it final usually, but I call it release. In either event, what's gonna happen is we'll just have the restored databases. It won't know anything about the backup files. It won't know anything about how we restored them, nothing. It won't have the restore scripts. It will just have the database that has been restored. That's it, okay? So that's our Docker file. That's how we restore a, a backup from a .bak file, how we restore it into SQL Server and then create a release SQL Server that has just that restored database. So let's save this. We're gonna save this, this PC, C drive, temp, Docker, and we'll call this Docker file. And we're gonna have no extension on here. I'm not sure we can do that in this window. Um, so I'm gonna hit save. Even though it's gonna say .txt, this is a problem on Windows. We're gonna go ahead and take off that .txt. And it says, it's maybe it's unstable. Are you sure you wanna change it? Yes, we do. So Docker file with no extension. That's what you want. 
and we'll close this out like so. And now we're back to our console here, our PowerShell. And so we need to run the command to first of all, build the image. Before we just did a Docker run, but we already had an image to work from. Now we're building our own image that has extra stuff. So we're gonna say docker build dash t to give it a tag. And we'll call this the, let's just call it uh, restored db. So that's the name of it. And I'm not, I'm gonna call it colon latest. So I'm gonna apply a tag to it and just say this is the latest version of the restored db. You don't have to tag it. If you do, you have to refer to the tag unless it's the latest version. So I could not put a tag on it. It's up to you if you want to or not. Let's um, let's leave it off. So the last thing you do, and this is the thing I always forget, so be careful that you don't forget it as well, is you say dot. That dot represents where the Docker file is that you're trying to execute. So I'm doing a build which builds off a Docker file and that Docker file is located in dot, which means this current directory. So this current directory should have a file called Docker file, all one word, no extension. And that's what we have. Okay, so we have that right here, Docker file, and it's in the C temp Docker. And since we're on C temp Docker, we can run that right here. This is a multi-step process. Notice one of 10, two of 10, three of 10, all right through seven. It's now installing SQL Server. It's waiting those 10 seconds until it's done, but it's actually already installed. This 15, 30, 100%, that has restored our adventure works. It's moved those files around. It's now created a new image, it's a release image. It has copied over those files. And now if we do a clear the screen, and do a Docker images, we'll notice we have a couple of new images. One's called none, and it's got an image ID, and it's 1.42 gigabytes. Then we have another one called restore-db, tagged with latest. I didn't tag it, but since I didn't tag it, it gave it a tag of latest. And it was done 18 seconds ago versus 19, and it's a little bit smaller. Well. What this is, is this is the intermediate step. And it saved it for us, even though we're not gonna be using it directly. The reason it did so is because it has cached that step. So that if we decide to build this again, if we decide, you know what? I want a newer version of this restore-db image. It's gonna check and see what's changed. And if nothing has changed, it will use all the cache steps and be done almost instantly. If something changed halfway through, it'll use the first half of those steps will be cached and remember those and just bring those over. It won't redo them. So it's a pretty efficient process. At first I was a little frustrated that it's leaving stuff behind in my machine, but the reality is that's left behind to make your process faster. Okay. Now, you see 1.41, 1.42, 1.33, and you might think, oh man, that's, that's four gigabytes cumulative. That can get huge. It's not four gigabytes, okay? Because it's based, they're all based upon this image right here. So that 1.33 is reused in this one and in this one. So we're not, we're not adding each of these together. So we're not recreating that 1.33 gigabytes. It's just the layers on top. So they're really, really tiny. So in reality, we're using about 0.08 gigabytes for our restored DB image. Okay, so just note, don't freak out with the size. Okay, so now that we have that, we can do our Docker run. But it's a little different this time. We're gonna do dash P and we'll do our one, one, four, three, three to one, four, three, three, the map or port. And we'll do our dash D for disconnected. Notice I don't have any environmental variables anymore. And the reason why is because they're in the Docker file. I don't have to specify them. So that's already done for me. And now 
I just give it the image name. So restored-db. I could name my, my Docker run, but I'm not going to. I'm going to let it generate the name for me. So Docker run, map the port, disconnected mode, and the image to use is not Microsoft's. It's my new image. I hit enter. It's already done. I can come over to my SQL server and let's do a refresh here. And I have AdventureWorks. And AdventureWorks has tables and I can pull up tables. Let's look at customer data and notice there's a whole bunch of customer data in here. Okay, so I've restored my SQL server from backup and I've done so in a safe way. And the result is a running SQL server with my restored database in again, just a couple of minutes. Now, I want to take this one step further because this is often used, this process is often used to test out your restore process of your SQL backups. But what if you wanted to also give your software developers or even yourself a copy of the production database to use as your development database? Because the closer you get to production as far as the data, the more likely you're gonna find bugs before you get to production. However, the downside of giving production data to your developers is that you're giving away sensitive data and putting on, on unsecured machines. So for example, let's look at what we have here. We have uh, last names, might be a sensitive information. Email address, definitely sensitive. Think if a developer's machine was compromised, all of these email addresses could be lost and that'd not be a good thing. Phone numbers, we don't wanna give away real phone numbers, especially if we have a calling system or a texting system that we're testing out. What if we accidentally tested it against our development machine, which more likely happens than on a production, but if we tested it accidentally and actually sent texts to real customers with fake data, not a good thing. Password hash and password salt. Well, these are, these are protected. That's not necessarily a good thing to give away because it still is a safety concern. So with all of these being available, and we're just gonna look at this, this table for now, but with all these being available, we can't just give this to developers or even to ourselves and put on a, a machine and say, you know, go use it wherever, show other people, whatever. Not a great idea. So what do we do about that? Well, remember the fact that we have AdventureWorks as the email address, we have password hashes, we have full last names, okay? We're gonna change that. So what we're gonna do is make a couple of changes. Let's actually, you know what, I'm gonna keep this open. Let's open up a new query window. I'm gonna drag it over a different script that I have. And this one is my sanitize script. So it starts off the same. Restore the database, okay? Same exact script. And I have a go at the end, and then I say use AdventureWorks, which is the database we just restored. And I have a go again to change the database to AdventureWorks. And then I have this update script. Now this is manual. This is something you have to do for yourself. I can't write a script for you that will clean your database because your database may be different or your rules on what has to be cleaned may be different. So this does have to come down to your particular case, but I've created an example for you. So for example, email address. I said, well, email address, we can use the first name of the person because that's not necessarily sensitive. First name plus at timcoenterprise.com. So now, it's going to be Tim at TimCoEnterprise.com or Mary at TimCoEnterprise.com, not their uh, AdventureWorks email address. So that obscures the email addresses or makes them um, safe to be given out. And at the same time, they still look like email addresses. Last time I changed all last names to customer. So that's another option. Just set to customer. So it's going to be, you know, John Q customer, Mary P customer. 
the phone number, I grabbed this off the internet and, and customized it some. And in fact, we're going to have to shrink the screen just a bit to see the whole thing. There we go. So this right here, and it's a long one, and it's not terribly efficient, just so you know. It's not bad, but it's not terribly efficient. There's other ways of doing this, and there's even tools to help you do this. But if you want to do it manually, what this does is it creates a random number, and then it formats it as a phone number. Because I wanted to have the, you know, area code dash, first three numbers dash, last four numbers type of pattern, like these pound signs are indicating. But I wanted to have random numbers so that it could never be deconstructed. And that is something to be careful of, is the fact that you don't want to use the actual phone number and, and change it in a predictable pattern. Because then what will happen is people can reverse engineer that back to the original data. So I'm just using random numbers and putting it in a format, and that's the new phone number. Password hash and password salt, we're not going to try and log in as the customers. So I say, you know what? Just wipe those two out. There's no reason to, to keep those. So that's all I did is I added this update script. Now, in your case, you'd probably have a lot more scripts than this and a lot more uh, complexity to it. There are tools, like I said, out there. One of the tools that's, um, that I've seen it seems pretty good is uh, Redgate has a tool. It's not free, but it does allow you to um, apply some of these things in a more uh, standard way. So, for example, last names you could put in from a list of random last names that include some of the more tricky ones like O'Brien, where there's the, the tick mark in there, or other special characters, at least special for the U.S., um, characters that you know other countries use more commonly, but you might not be testing against. Because if you always have Tim, Mary, Sue, and Bob, that's not great first names to test against. Where if you bring in some of these uh, test cases that are a little more um, maybe edge cases in what you're dealing with typically, but that's what you want to bring in. And so it can even elevate your, your testing game. So there's tools you can do use to do that. But in this case, I'm just doing a script. So I just added this at the end of my restore. That's all I've done. So now, and let's close this out. We'll pin this back open because it should come back. But first thing I do is I'm going to stop and delete this this um, SQL Server. So I'm going to do a Docker stop 4C1 and Docker remove 4C1. Now I'm also, I could, let's do a clear screen. I could do a, a Docker images. I could remove this. What I'm going to do instead is I'm just going to create a new version. I'll give it a version number. So right now it says latest. It's not ideal to have something the latest that's not the latest, but that's okay. The other thing I'm going to do is let's open back up Notepad++. And I'm going to bring the Docker file in. And instead of restore dash backup, I have restore dash and dash sanitize dash backup. So restore and sanitize backup. That's the only change I'm going to make to the Docker file. So now let's run. We can actually go back to this right here, Docker build. And I'm going to give it a new version. So let's say 1.0.1. .1. And again, that dot is important at the end. And notice using cache, using cache, using cache, using cache. So it used the cache until it got to the, the restore step down here. So that's pretty important. And it says, oops, nope, you can't do that because invalid file name. So I've broken something. Cool. Let's do Docker images and see that we actually have an image created that's 1.34 gigabytes and it's kind of half half formed. Well, we shouldn't have any Docker PS-A. Ooh, we do. Uh, so and it exited with a code of one. So it was it started this image in order to work on it and it 
it left it in a weird state. So I can do, I'm gonna do a, a different command, docker system prune dash F for force. And that's gonna delete that container and a bunch of images. And if we do a clear screen and do a docker images now, we have just the restored dash DB. It cleared out the, the unnamed ones. And we also have docker ps dash A. We have no running containers or stopped containers. So that's kind of a cleanup command if you wanna run that um, to clean up any stopped and any hanging uh, temporary images. So let's open up our Docker file again and look at what we did wrong. Well, we copied this file, but then we tried to run this file. So let's change that. So now I'll run the correct file and copy the right file. And that should be all we need to do for the version 1.0.1. And notice it's still using the cache here for this step but then from then on, it has to um, start over basically and build it from scratch, okay? When you highlight in PowerShell, it stops the screen from displaying. So that's why when I highlight it pauses. Okay, so now this is done. Notice 847 rows affected. That's when it has run that script. So it ran the script, restored the database, changed the context adventure works, and then it ran the script and it affected 847 rows. So the image is created. If we do a Docker images, we'll see now we have again a restored dash DB, but where this one says latest, this one says 1.0.1. .1. We're gonna use the 1.0.1. .1. So when we do a Docker run, let's go up my commands, there we go. Restore dash DB 1.0.1. .1. So we're gonna do a Docker run, we're gonna map the port, we're gonna do it in disconnected mode, or I'm sorry, detached. I always say disconnected, but it's detached mode. That's one of those mental blocks that I have. Detached mode and restore dash DB with a tag of 1.0.1, .1, which is the latest one. We hit enter and we're done, it's running. And now if we refresh this, we still adventure works. It still has the same tables, but if you come to customer and do a, um, a select top 100, in fact, you know what? Yeah, that'll work. We'll just zoom. So let's zoom in here. Notice last name is customer. The email address is Orlando at timcoenterprises.com. This phone number, you can't really tell, but this phone number actually is different because it's a random phone number and no password hash or salt. So we've cleaned things up. We've made things more or less sensitive or, or not sensitive at all. And yet it's still a production database that we can use to do testing against. Okay. So that's how we installed SQL server. We restored a backup. We cleaned up the data and we ran that SQL server. All of that in just a couple of minutes. And the fact that we can then script this, meaning this PowerShell, all we need is this command right there to rebuild that image. If you want to change that file, you just need this command right here. And then this command, and that's it, okay? So you can even set that up to run automatically, or, and here's what I do, so right now, let's clear the screen, do a docker ps-a, and notice that this has been up for about a minute. So I've been, I can work on this database all I want, but then I can do a docker stop d82. And now, if I do a docker ps-a, you'll see it was exited with a status of zero, which is success, four seconds ago. So it's turned off. My machine now does not have a working version of SQL installed. There's one on disk ready to go whenever I want it, but it's not in memory. It's not taking up processors time. It's not taking up RAM. 
It's just sitting there on disk. When I'm ready, I say docker start d82. Now I have SQL Server running. It's taking up memory, it's taking up processor, and I can use it however I want. Okay, so really quick to get SQL Server either stopped fully and, and totally or started. If I want Docker off my system entirely, I'm sorry, if I want SQL off my system entirely, if, if I want to do an uninstall, rip the whole thing out and start with a new version of SQL Server, not a problem. I do Docker stop D82, and then I do a Docker remove D82. Now SQL Server is entirely uninstalled. If I wanted to install a new version, let's say SQL Server 2019 comes out, developer edition, I will make a change. Oops, I would come over to my Docker file. I would change this to whatever tag Microsoft appends for the 2019. I change it there and I would change it there. And then I'd do those two commands and I'm back up and running this time with my restored databases to SQL Server 2019. Now, if you've ever installed SQL Server on your machine, you know how much of a pain it is. First of all, the amount of configuration options in there is pretty impressive. And the fact that it takes up a lot of space. We're taking up a gig and a half, essentially. On Windows, that would take up 10 plus gigabytes. And it would run in the background all the time. The services are constantly running. And it would constantly take memory from us. So then we want to install, maybe a new update comes out. We have to you know, make sure you have that installed and patched. And then a totally new version comes out, we have to uninstall and reinstall. All that stuff takes a lot of time and it's not really your job as a developer. It's not what you're, what you're doing primarily for your work. What you're primarily trying to do is write code. So every minute you spend configuring SQL, tweaking SQL, installing patches, installing new versions, trying things out where it takes lots of time, rebuilding your machine since your machine is now slow from all the installations and uninstallations. All that is not your job. And it takes away time from doing your primary purpose. So now with Docker, we can install a Linux version, which is more uh, streamlined. It's much, much smaller. It's fast. It's performant. And putting it on a machine takes a couple of minutes. Upgrading versions takes a couple of minutes. And I'm exaggerating when I say a couple of minutes. Because really, once you understand how this process works, you can have it down, have it um, uninstalled and reinstall the new version in probably 30 seconds. Okay? All that can be done using Docker. So Docker, really powerful tool for not only SQL developers, not only uh, desktop developers, but really for a, a large portion of the IT community. So I would definitely recommend that if you haven't tried this yet, Give it a shot. Install SQL Server this way, even if you have SQL on your machine. Because remember, we use that port command. Let's clear the screen here. We use the port command. We did the Docker run. We mapped a different port. And you can choose whatever port you want as long as it's not being used. So you could have four, five, six, seven, eight versions of SQL Server installed on Docker, all with different ports. So if you wanted to have... Um, the 2017 version, a 2012 version, a you know cumulative update for on Ubuntu for whatever you can have it. You can have all the different versions running at the same time, or have images ready to run any of them if you want to test things out. And you can have them against different ports. So a lot of stuff you can do here real quick as a developer. This will make you faster because it will allow you to write more code. Okay, so I definitely encourage you to learn this. I definitely encourage you to use it. Okay, now down in the comments, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are. I'd love to hear, you know, what confused you, what um, maybe you want to see more of with Docker. This is a somewhat more advanced topic. I do have a full course on it because Docker, quite frankly, when I started using it, confused me. There's a lot of commands to, to know. And when you 
when you hear people talk about it at conferences or in videos, typically you hear four, five, six, eight different technologies that are in addition to Docker that you have to know or they think you have to know. And it often gets confusing. When you boil it all down, it can be rather simple to use, like we have here, a Docker build and a Docker run, that's it. Now in the course, I break down every single one of those commands in the Docker file. So what each of these things do, why they do it, how they do it, and when you'd use it. I also break down all the different options for run, for build, and some other commands as well to maintain Docker on your machine and really get the most out of it. Now, Docker can be used like we saw here with SQL, but you can also use it for web servers. So if you wanna pull up a quick web server, this is a great way of doing it. If you want to build an image locally, test it out, and then move that entire image up to Azure, you can do that. The huge benefit there is you get past the idea of it works on my machine. So if you've been a developer for any time at all, you've come across this thing where you build it and it runs for you, but you give it to somebody else or you send it to the cloud and it doesn't work and you don't know why. Well, typically it's some sort of configuration difference or it's some sort of setting or maybe it's a patch version or something else that's interfering. With Docker, you get past all of those things. Because whatever you build on your machine, if it runs, it will run the exact same way everywhere. Because it takes that entire image, makes it read only, and it uses that as the base for your containers. So you can take your image on your machine, if it works, you can send it to the cloud. And then you can run it in Azure in multiple instances even. If you have a problem in production, you can take that image and pull it down to your machine. And now you have the production image on your machine and will work the exact same way in your machine that it did on production. So really powerful stuff. I definitely encourage you to dive deeper into it, learn more about it and get to know it because we're gonna be using it a lot more on this channel as we come across more and more, especially .NET Core things that use Docker, okay? Now again, microservices, this is a big one. So if, if you have any inclination at all, to move towards microservices, you absolutely need to learn Docker because microservices without Docker are incredibly painful, almost unusable. With Docker, they're still difficult. So I'm not gonna sugarcoat that, but much easier with Docker, okay? So that's Docker. Let me know what you th your thoughts are down in the comments. Again, other suggestions, I'd love to hear them. And thanks for watching, and as always, I am Tim Corey.